Being disorganized doesn't mean that you're a slob or that you're lazy or anything like that. What it means is that you're missing the habit that gives you that last bit of follow through that allows you to see a job through to completion. That's really all it is. Hey there, my name is Corinne O'Flynn and you're listening to the Calm Entrepreneur Podcast. I am a USA Today bestselling author, nonprofit executive, and organizing nerd with over 20 years experience running my own small businesses. I teach entrepreneurs, solopreneurs, and small business owners like you how to organize your business, find more time, and deepen your alignment practice to experience more calm and confidence every single day. If you're looking for that intersection between practical business advice and spiritual goodness, then you're in the right place. So sit back, relax, and let's dive into this week's episode of the Calm Entrepreneur Podcast. Welcome, welcome to the Calm Entrepreneur Podcast. I'm Corinne O'Flynn, your host, and this is episode three. In today's episode, I want to talk about decluttering and specifically digital decluttering. But before I dig into that, I wanted to talk to you about organizing as a whole. When most people hear the words get organized, they think about it as if it were something they can schedule in a time slot on their calendar, like it's an event. And if you get nothing else out of this episode, I want you to take this with you because it is really important for all of us, but especially important for you if you are someone who is struggling under the weight of clutter. And that is this. I want you to think about organizing as a practice and not as an event. Sure, we can schedule some time every week, every month, every quarter to have a huge effort and put that into getting something organized. But what if you didn't have to make it an overwhelming event? What if some of the things that you're struggling with today stop being a struggle at all? What if we stopped thinking about getting organized the way we think about going in for our annual checkup once a year? And instead, we start thinking about it like we do about brushing our teeth every day, or better yet, something smaller. What if we thought about it like putting milk back in the fridge after you make your tea, which if you're like me, that happens about 25 times a day. So when it comes to getting your digital life organized, yes, it is possible to schedule it as an event. But if you're like most people, that works in the moment. And maybe you're able to keep it going after a little while, but for the most part, it isn't something you're able to maintain. And eventually, you're going to be back into the same mess that you started with. It's a cycle, and it's frustrating, and it really doesn't have to be that way. Chances are that if you have an issue with clutter in one area of your life, you likely have clutter in other areas of your life. Honestly, I don't know anyone who doesn't struggle with clutter in one form or another, myself included. So what does that tell you? And before you start giving yourself a bunch of negative self-talk, I'm going to shut that down right here and right now. Because if you struggle with digital clutter, or any clutter for that matter, there is nothing wrong with you. It simply means that you are a modern human living a normal, modern life. You're not incapable, you're not defective, and you are not a failure. Being disorganized doesn't mean that you're a slob or that you're lazy or anything like that. All it means is that you're missing the habit that gives you that last bit of follow through that allows you to see a job through to completion. So why should we declutter our digital spaces? I'd like you to think about decluttering as a form of self-care, because when you get right down to it, that's exactly what it is. Self-care, as you know, is all the things that we do to protect ourselves and improve our health and our well-being and our happiness. And digital clutter is costing us so much in our everyday lives, and that is not going away anytime soon. We are more and more dependent on our digital devices and our connectivity through our devices every single day. So it behooves all of us, to prioritize management of our digital clutter. So what is digital clutter? Digital clutter includes things like your email inbox, your documents, your photos, your music. That's the stuff that most people think about when they hear the words digital clutter. But it's also the apps on your devices, your browser bookmarks, your passwords, your notifications, your social media feed, your connectivity programs like Discord and Slack, your project management software, 
everything from the files on your desktop all the way to your calendar and to your to-do list. Just thinking about all of these things I just mentioned causes my pulse to race a little bit because it's a lot and it's something that all of us deal with. We are doing a lot of things on a lot of screens all the time. So what does clutter cost you? Digital clutter costs us our time, right? Anything that we allow into our space is going to take time from us. Even productivity apps and calendars and task managers, those things require time and attention from us to get from them the work that we need to do the things that we need to do in a day. So if we don't have a way to keep these things organized, every single time we access anything, it's probably going to take more time than it could, which leaves us less time for the things that we need and we want to do. Digital clutter costs your focus. The biggest culprit when it comes to focus loss is all of the notifications, I think, that come from the services and the apps that we subscribe to and the ones that we use on a daily basis. Even our personal life intrudes in this way with text messages and emails and phone calls. And if the notifications are on for all of these things every single time that happens, what you're forced to do is context switch. Even if you ignore the text message that just dinged on your phone, it dinged. Your focus was pulled from something that you were working on into the fact that a text message just arrived. That's a distraction. And anytime you are forced into context switching, that means it's going to take you that much longer to drop back into flow. It's going to take you that much longer to fall back into whatever it was that you were doing before you got distracted. And this is an interesting thing that I discovered. There's a study um, that talked about disruption. And I call it in my, when I think about it, I remind myself that it's the crockpot study because did you know that every time you take the lid off of a crockpot, to check the goodness inside. You add approximately 20 minutes to the cook time? Well, guess what? Human beings are just like crockpots. According to a study out of the University of California, Irvine, it takes 23 minutes or more to refocus after an interruption. And that means that a five-minute interruption actually costs you about 28 minutes of lost productivity because you have the five-minute interruption plus the 20 minutes of recalibration And that's every single time. Now, before you try to tell yourself that that's not something that you struggle with because you know how to multitask and a single distraction doesn't derail you for 28 minutes, it could very well be that it doesn't, doesn't take you the entire 23 minutes to get back into the flow, but there is absolutely no way that it doesn't impact you. And that, you know, brings me to an, an aside, another thing that I think we need to put to rest once and for all, and that is the myth of multitasking. According to another study out of Stanford, not only is multitasking not an actual thing, because what's really happening, your brain is switching quickly from multiple discrete tasks. This is actually harmful to you. And heavy multitaskers were shown to score worse on simple memory tests. So how's that for a wake-up call? Right? So maybe it's time to like drop this, this, badge of honor that we're able to multitask because you, you really aren't. What you're doing is compensating. Anyway, back to the decluttering. This doesn't even begin to scratch the surface about the tangible things that digital clutter costs you, which is things like losing track of your stuff, losing track of the files that you've downloaded, or downloading several copies of the same thing over and over because you can't find the last copy in your bloated downloads folder. How many times have you looked at your downloads folder and seen a file name with a number one, number two, number three. I once, and I'll confess, I am not immune to any of this. I once downloaded a file from a website and when it landed in my downloads folder, it was actually number 11. It was version number 11 of the same exact file. So this is something that I know that I'm not alone in, right? So for some It's the reason that they're always running late. It's the reason they're missing appointments. It's why we have to cram and crunch to get deadlines met because we didn't schedule things properly, or maybe we forgot a due date. All of these things result in one of the saddest consequences of all, and that is that digital clutter costs us by not allowing us to be present, 
Now, I say sad because it costs us presence with our people, right? With our family. But it also costs us presence in meetings and hanging out with our friends. And it also costs us being present in the work that we're trying to do. And that's not all. Digital clutter costs you your energy and your well-being. Does thinking about tackling your clutter feel overwhelming to you? How often have you put off a task like organizing all of the digital photos that you have or doing your taxes simply because it would require you to face the digital clutter mountain that you've been cultivating? Clutter has been shown to increase cortisol levels in the bloodstream. Cortisol is the stress hormone, folks, right? A study from St. Lawrence University in New York found that people who sleep in cluttered bedrooms are more likely to have sleeping problems, which includes trouble falling asleep and trouble staying asleep. And the University of Minnesota researchers found a connection between being disorganized and having a healthy diet. They found that people who spent just spent some time in a disorganized room were twice as likely to eat chocolate then choose an apple when offered snacks. These studies, of course, are talking about physical clutter. But I would argue that physical clutter and digital clutter impact us in the same or similar ways because of the way that we interact with all of these cluttered spaces on a regular basis. So what else does digital clutter cost you? You're like, wait, 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 Corinne, there's more? And yes, there's so much more. And I'm not going to go into all the different ways it costs you because I think I'm making my point here. But a big one, that digital clutter costs you is money. How many times have you signed up for a free trial or a paid subscription and totally forgot about it until it renewed and it was too late? How many apps are on your phone right now that have a monthly or an annual subscription? Do you know without having to look? And what is your time worth? You know, when you're talking about cost, if how much time are you wasting because of your digital clutter? If you can't find that file or if you can't find that appointment, or if you can't find those notes that you wrote at a meeting. If you're somebody who charges for your time, for example, as a consultant, and you spend an hour looking for something, that's an hour of your time. You have a value, a dollar value associated to that time. So we've established that digital clutter steals our time, our focus, our energy, our sleep, our money, our contentment, our satisfaction and our ability to be productive and meet our deadlines and goals. So now what? What are we supposed to do with that information? Something that I find is very common when I talk to people about tackling digital clutter or changing the way that we manage our digital clutter is that everybody struggles with not knowing where to start. If this is something that has you shaking your head, then you're in luck. I have a download for you that is a simple checklist to get you started on your digital declutter practice. And that's available at the show notes, which you can find at corinneoflin.com forward slash episode three. And that is the word episode and the digit three. I want to take a moment here to reiterate something that I feel very strongly about. And that is that you need to ease into this and start where you are, period. So what does that mean? This means choose one area of focus and whether that be your email inbox or your notifications or your downloads folder, for example, pick one of those places. And pick one function of those places and start being mindful about it going forward. One of the mantras that I repeat most often with my clients and the people that I support is start where you are. Start where you are. Don't go backward. And the reason why this is important is because I want you to make it as easy to stick with as possible. And this is vital because there's no point in doing any of this if it doesn't stick, right? We want habits that stick. So start the habit by moving forward with it and interacting with it in your natural rhythm. I don't want you to add a block of time to your day. I don't want you to add to your day. I want this to be part of your flow. So don't rearrange the way that you do things already. Just add this on to your natural functions. So what does this look like? So let's take an example and decide that you're going to choose your email inbox and you're going to organize this differently. I want you to decide the way that you're going to organize your inbox so that it works for you. And then I want you to start with the next email that comes in. Just one. I'm not even joking. Just one email. I don't want you to spend the next 24 hours sifting through the emails that already piled up. 
Because once you have this new system in place and you have a rhythm with it and you understand how it works for you, that's when you're going to start chunking the past. And what I mean by that is, let's say you've decided to start organizing your emails that you're receiving into folders. Well, I want you to start with the very next email, like I said, and set up a folder for that email. And then the one after that, and then the one after that. So literally, if you're listening to this podcast at 11 o'clock in the morning and you're finished by 1130 and you decide today is the day. So the next time you get back to your desk, I want you to do this with the very next email. I don't even want you to go back to this morning's emails. And I want you to do this for a week or two weeks or a month, whatever feels comfortable for you. The important part is that this new filing system starts to feel like a normal piece of your email routine. You have now stacked that habit onto your normal email habit. And that is when you start to go back. And when you go back, what you do is you set a timer once or twice a day or make it part of your morning routine and do it one time or one time during your evening routine. So let's say it's 15 minutes. You take your timer 15 minutes and you start moving through the most recent batch of emails and one at a time you create a filing system for them and you put them in their files and you put them in their folders. And if a 15 minute timer is too much of a hassle or is not going to be something that that sticks for you, which is fine, then just do 10 emails or 15 emails and eventually you will get your inbox tamed. Now the goal here with the inbox in particular is not perfection. We are not going for inbox zero. That's not something that works for everybody. Now for me, I love getting my inbox down to zero and I keep it there on a regular basis, but I have several friends of mine who use their inbox like a to-do list. They leave the emails that are action items sitting in the email inbox until they finish with it and then they archive it or they file it at that point. So the important piece is you do you, right? Take that away from here. You do you. I'm not here to change the way that you work. I'm here to help you find ways to simplify in any areas where digital clutter is causing you struggle. So if you're interested in tackling your digital clutter and don't know where to start, check out my free digital clutter, a simple start checklist. This is a resource that I made for you so that you can give yourself some quick wins while also reducing clutter and building that new habit. You can get that again at corinnoflynn.com forward slash episode three. And that is the word episode and the digit three with no spaces. And I want to reiterate, you don't need to do an overhaul to make an impact. So I hope that if you're able to implement even one of these suggested tasks in my download list, that you'll begin to believe that it's possible for you because it absolutely is. And this goes back to something that I mentioned in my very first episode, episode one of this podcast. It was all about mindset. And the reason why I made that the first episode is because that's the foundation. That is what it's all about. If you believe that it is within your grasp to tackle and com completely conquer your digital clutter, then guess what? You're right. And the same goes if you don't believe it. If you don't believe it, you're right. So you need to trust that it's possible for you to get a handle on this. And the best way to build that trust is to honor yourself by taking it really, really slow and starting really, really small and building that habit really, really incrementally. And as a writer, I'm dying that I keep saying really, really over and over again. But I, re I really, really want this to, to, to hammer home into your brain. You're not going to get a medal if you sit down at the end of today and clear your inbox. What you're going to get is a clear inbox and no habit. So that's groovy, but it's not going to work. So what I want you to do is do one small thing and then tomorrow one small thing and then continue to do the one small thing. And once the one small thing is something you don't even think about doing anymore, that's when you start doing the overhaul stuff. And I promise you, if you trust yourself and keep your word to yourself and you tell yourself, I no longer am available for digital clutter and I don't need to overhaul every department of my business or every department of my life. I'm going to tackle emails today. And maybe, you know, next quarter, we're going to talk about your digital download folder or your desktop on your computer. You don't, you don't have to do it all today. It's going to be the same. It's going to be waiting for you no matter how long you wait. But, you know, let's get started. So that's it. 
today we talked about a whole bunch of stuff with digital clutter. And I want to recap for you. So I described what digital clutter was and how we should change the way we think about organizing, right? Organizing is no longer just this event that we do. It's actually a practice that we adopt, right? It's something that we're going to assimilate into our world. And we're going to learn to capture that follow through. And we're going to be follow throughers from this point on. Amen, right? We've talked about the cost of digital clutter, how it costs your time, your focus, your well-being, your money, your peace, your stress, your sleep. All these things are taken from us by digital clutter. And then we talked about, you know, the simple way that we can build the practice. And I, I know I'm being repetitive here because it's really that important. And I think the thing that I want to hammer home here is knowing about it isn't enough. And I took that from a class that I'm actually taking right now through Harvard that's available on Coursera for free. And it's called the science of happiness. And it's apparently this, it's gone viral. It's the very most popular class that Harvard's ever made available to people. And it was like a one-off kind of a class that was started off as an experiment. But one of the things that the professor talks about in that class is we know that Practice A, practice B, practice C, that doing these things makes us happy. We know that performing these actions will make us happy and that these are the ways, this is the way, the path. And like one of those things is like journaling. And another one is like getting barefoot and walking on the earth, right? Touching grass. We know that those things are the things that will bring us closer to happiness, We also know that knowing them isn't enough. Yeah, actually have to do them. And whether or not you believe in it is irrelevant. Taking off your shoes and walking on the grass will produce the outcome that will lead you toward a happier and uh, more peaceful well-being, if you will. So that's why I say to you over and over and over again in this, you need to trust the process here. I really want you to not overhaul. I don't want you to listen to this episode and then sit down at your desk and wipe out your inbox and then email me and say, yay, I did it. Yay. Yay me. Because as wonderful as that is, it's it's not the point. The point is to build a habit where you become a follow througher. So if nothing else, I want you to take one email today and file it. Not even two, just one email. And then tomorrow do two, the next day do three, whatever it takes for you to do this in the tiniest, most incremental steps so that you build a habit out of it. Okay. I think I've, I've beat this horse um, into the ground. Thank goodness it's a digital horse and we're all in our imaginations. So that's all I have for you today. Thank you for listening. And I hope that you have a wonderful week and I will catch you next week on the podcast. This is Corinne signing off. Remember, part of being a calm entrepreneur is developing the systems, habits, and know-how that lets you know that you are the one in the driver's seat. You get to choose how you run your business and you get to choose how you work. So you got this. I hope you enjoyed listening to this episode of the Calm Entrepreneur Podcast. I'm Corinne O'Flynn, and if this episode was valuable to you, please head on over and rate and review wherever you consume your podcasts. Please subscribe so you'll never miss an episode. New episodes go out each week on Tuesdays, and I look forward to hanging with you again. This is Corinne signing off. Have an excellent day.